Yo, welcome to csjoseph.life, uh, doing an episode for season 16. Probably one of the more anticipated episodes that we've been waiting for for a while. I haven't been around because, you know, hashtag single fatherhood, and I am taking my children with me on a trip for Thanksgiving. And that's what's going on with me, and I'm having to spend a lot of time preparing for that and I just come off getting sick. I am on the path to recovery, and uh, I've been recovering pretty well uh, with that. So awesome, and uh, I'm very excited uh, to somewhat be back, even though technically I am leaving just as fast as I came. Yeah, but that's because uh, I have responsibilities. So uh, this is going to be uh, Thanksgiving week uh, coming up. Uh, I'm gonna be releasing uh, probably some teasers on Instagram, so check that out. Uh, but for the most part, going to be uh, doing Thanksgiving and family related things. So you might not see me much on the channel. And I believe all live streams are canceled next week. So anyway, uh, with that being said, uh, let's get down to business here for this episode. Season 16, what is the cognitive attitude of the critic function? Uh, this is going to be season 16, episode 6. So, uh, remember, when we're talking about cognitive functions, uh, we have to uh, give credit where it is due. And cognitive function uh, attitude uh, theory comes from Dr. John Beebe. And this is as a result of uh, you know, his work involving Carl Jung and uh, Carl Jung's uh, theory on cognitive senses. And then you have Dr. John Beebe who took the uh, theory of cognitive senses and changed it to you know, cognitive functions and then provided uh, attitude archetypes, little mini archetypes attached to each of the cognitive functions with, uh, with anyone's function stack, uh, mentally speaking. So a function stack is eight cognitive functions and you have the hero attitude, the parent, the child, the inferior slash aspirational, the nemesis slash the ally, then there's the critic, also known as the scenix, or the witch, or the wizard. Uh, then you have the trickster, or the unaware function. And then finally you have the demon function, also known as the parasite. So these are the eight cognitive functions within their different spectra. If you want to understand cognitive spectra and be introduced to Mr. Radiohead, I suggest you watch that episode in season one. I highly recommend that episode as much as possible. Uh, it really gives you an idea of how our brains work as radio transceivers sending and receiving signals as if each of these eight cognitive functions are basically channels with which our mind is able to channel things into mentally in and out and we're sending and receiving signals all the time to all available brains near us like it's like whoa wait are you saying that we're telepathic and like yes actually i am i am saying saying that specifically because it's all about sending and receiving all about extroversion versus introversion and how our brains and our minds and our souls basically are able to communicate with fellow human beings on a regular basis. So anyway, that being said, yes, Dr. John Beebe, if you want to learn more about uh, cognitive attitudes and cognitive functions, please read Dr. John Beebe. He is the dopest and uh, he will be able to give you a better idea, maybe even better than me perhaps, uh, on you know where these uh, where these things lie, etc., and and how this works. So fair enough. Also, we have a coaching giveaway. It is on Instagram. Uh, the winner is likely to be announced uh, tonight or tomorrow. I think it was tomorrow that we have it scheduled, if I remember correctly. And uh, so that will be announced. It will be announced on the Instagram. So basically how it's going to work is uh, someone is randomly chosen in the comments and as long as they're a follower and they left a like for the post, they will be chosen for the giveaway. It will be announced and they will receive a coupon code to use uh, in our Shopify uh, store to be able to uh, you know, get free coaching, essentially, uh, one-time use, et cetera. And then they can schedule it as such for a free coaching session uh, with me, and then uh, we can get them set up. And this time it's not live coaching, it's like the private coaching, like the regular thing, so uh, no worries on that. But yes, uh, that should be announced within the next 24 hours on Instagram. Don't forget that. So anyway, let's talk about the critic function. So the critic function is uh, the sixth cognitive function. It's, uh, it's like the parent function. It's like the parent function of the unconscious. The unconscious is also known as the shadow, right? And the unconscious is basically the ego's cognitive functions, except flipped on the introversion versus uh, extroversion. 
completely flipped. And uh, that's great. Um, wow, I really hope nobody calls me right now because if someone calls me that's going to interrupt this camera feed, then I have to start all over and that would really suck. So yeah, I hope, hopefully like no one calls me, that would be nice. So please don't call me, even though it's kind of like worthless for saying that because I mean, it's a recording. Anyway, the point is, uh, so when you're looking at the sixth function, it is just like the parent function. The sixth function is just like the second function. It's, it's, it's a parent function, except it's not a parent function. Its attitude is more of a grandparent, okay? So yes, so is it a parent function? No, it's more like a grandparent. So yes, these cognitive functions, the critics, basically, because these are all critic functions here on the whiteboard that we have, they are basically like grandparents. You know, um, someone who is uh, wise beyond their years, essentially, or wise within their years, etc. But the thing is, is if you could develop your critic function early, you can actually become wiser beyond your years. And that's what you need to do. That's how the critic function actually works, right? And if you're a more shadow focused individual, or if you live in a shadow focused society, and then you become shadow focused, you have the opportunity to actually develop your critic even more than someone who's potentially subconscious focused. We learned recently that Taylor Swift, for example, is very subconscious focused. And because of that, as she gets on in years, she's developing her shadow, her um, uh, unconscious uh, side of her mind. So she's actually discovering uh, maturity after already discovered her happiness. Whereas the rest of us are, are, are have probably likely already discovered our maturity and are instead actually trying to discover our happiness, right? It's a little bit different. So if you wanna learn more about that, Definitely see the episode, How to Type uh, Taylor Swift Edition to, to kind of understand how that works. Cause I actually talk about that a little bit in length uh, within that live stream of recording that we did. So anyway, I'm gonna go through the cognitive functions now for the benefit of the podcast, those who are listening to the podcast because you can't see the whiteboard here. So we're gonna go through the cognitive functions audibly uh, for, their, uh, for their benefit here. So at the very top, we have FI Critic. Uh, FI Critic is uh, this, uh, the ISFJ and the INFJ's awareness of morals. It's also uh, sympathy, FI is sympathy, and FI is also uh, what causes a person to feel shame, right? Shame is the negative component, sympathy is the positive uh, component, it's about morals and principles, etc. And then we have TE critic, which is utilized by ESTPs and ENTPs, that's me. And then uh, we have rationale, beliefs, uh, standards, that's basically what uh, also also like a data manipulation, et cetera, a statistical awareness that is extroverted thinking and uh, critical towards rationale, et cetera. And then we have ESFPs and ENFPs next with extroverted feeling critic. This is their sense of ethics. Ethics is also known as empathy and it's also guilt. So empathy and guilt. Okay. So the positive thing is empathy, being empathetic towards others, feeling what other people feel and then uh, guilt, basically, uh, where, they, where they feel bad because of some harm that they did to another person, whereas sympathy is observing someone um, who, is, who is suffering and then feeling something as a result of observing that they're you know, suffering, they're being sympathetic towards that person. Being empathetic is already feeling someone then, and then coming in and solving a problem, per se. So it's a little bit different. Sympathy and empathy are not the same thing. So if I is sympathy, FE is empathy. And of course, tons of people out there disagree with me on that, on this. That's fine. Don't care because you're wrong. And uh, there you go. So anyway, then we have TI critic, which is what ISTJs and INTJs have utilized for verification and logic, their awareness of the true false, the awareness of facts. It's all about facts, right? And then ESTJs and ESFJs with their SE critic. They're very critical towards the physical environment, AKA physics, uh, what others are doing, right? How others present themselves, how other people look, basically, uh, from a physical standpoint. Um, then you have INTPs and INFPs with NI critic. Critical willpower, desire, and passion, etc. Critical towards, uh, towards that. And then we have ISTPs and ISFPs with SI critic. Uh, this is their sense of the past, their long-term memory, their loyalty, their honor, their duty, etc. And then you have ENTJs and ENFJs at the bottom with extrovert intuition critic, which is awareness of metaphysics, uh, prescience, uh, the collective future, other people's intentions, etc. So yeah, they're critical towards other people's intentions. But that in a nutshell are the eight cognitive functions who have critical attitudes, aka the critic, okay? 
So we're going to be talking about like what is the point uh, behind the critic? Why do we have critic functions and how do we develop critic functions and what are they used for? So let's let's kind of break it down. Let's 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 kind of look at like a, a more healthy or an unhealthy approach with some of these cognitive functions with some of these types right now and just kind of get an idea of like okay, why are they doing this? How does this work before we get into like the real deep stuff? You know what I'm saying? So so ISFJs and INFJs with FI critic. So because of this, FI critic uh, is its sense of morals, right? It's its sense of uh, sympathy. It feels shame. So quite honestly, ISFJs and INFJs, especially when they're younger, they just kind of walk around feeling ashamed by default. Yes, literally. They literally walk around feeling shameful by default because they're so critical because FI is a sense of self-worth, right? This is a person's sense of self-worth is introverted feeling and these people are walking around feeling like they're not good enough that they don't have enough self-worth oh you see what i'm saying it's and, and also not only that if i critic causes them to hold themselves to this impossibly high moral standard insanely high moral standard and then it gets even worse because when it goes like witch mode or wizard mode, where it gets super really dark, you know, the critic can become like this witch and it's got this like cauldron. It's like, eh, I'm making a spell and I'm very critical towards you. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it's like, okay, you're holding me to your impossibly high standard that you yourself can't hold yourself to? Hypocrite? See what I'm saying? See, that's, that's, that's an issue that ISFJs and INFJs have. So what they end up doing then is that they just, they feel worthless. They feel like they lack value. So they force themselves or they legitimately want to help other people with their FE parent and contribute to others and hopes that those people would give them the recognition that they want or need so that they can actually feel good about themselves because then they have the proof in hand Oh, this person recognizes me. This person, they value me. So because you value me, that means I can feel good about myself finally. Yes, <laughs> yes. And then all of a sudden they're like eating out of people's hands, right? Because that person like gives them recognition. Because that person is sympathetic to their cause, right? Because an FI critic needs an FI, I don't know, inferior child, parent, hero, to be sympathetic towards them, to have sympathy towards them. They want someone to feel good about them, right? And have sympathy towards them so that they don't feel so valueless, so they don't feel so worthless, so they don't feel meaningless. That's the thing. FI is all about meaning. And these types walk around feeling meaningless. It's like, yeah, but you're not. You're not meaningless at all. I mean, ISFJs, you're super mega loyal. You really help people. You defend traditions, even to the point, even if those traditions are crap, but you still defend traditions, right? And INFJs, you have the ability to change the world. And so many INFJs, you know, similar to you, have already changed the world in the past. And I'm only talking to you because of said INFJs. For example, we're only having this discussion, or YouTube probably only exists because of an INFJ. Who knows? The point is, like, FI critic is very important. So what you want to do is make sure that instead of being witchy about it, you know, and very overly critical towards your own self-worth, stop holding other people to your super high moral standard that you yourself can barely follow, if not even follow at all, right? Stop doing that. Like seriously, stop. I'm so tired of it. You want to know why you're alienating people? It's not necessarily because you're like, so right, you're wrong. Of course, that does alienate people, but it's also because your super high moral standard, no one else can actually hold themselves up to it and then they're intimidated by it. So IFJ types, if you guys think you wanna know why like you're so alone all the time, <laughs> maybe you should probably check your FI critic and make sure that your moral standard isn't so insanely high or that you're not able to meet it or that you're forcing your moral standard on other people that you yourself can't even follow. So why? Why are you doing this? Stop this, please, IFJs. It doesn't help anybody. 
Instead, be wise. Being wise with your moral principles, be wise with them. So you have to utilize wisdom. We'll talk more about wisdom. ESTPs, ENTPs, TE critic. Gosh, this is me. This is what causes ETPs to literally walk around assuming that everyone else around them is basically stupid. And we automatically assume that any graphs or statistics that we read is automatically wrong, right? Because chances are, from our point of view, if this is how everyone thinks, technically someone's wrong, so they're probably all wrong, right? If I haven't had the chance with my TI parent to actually verify the data in front of me on my own, I'm not gonna take it at face value. I'm not gonna take what this religion says I should do at face value. I'm not gonna take what this newspaper says at face value. I'm not gonna take what Anderson Cooper says or Wolf Blitzer says or uh, Chuck Schubert says. Uh, I don't even know if I said his name right. Uh, any of these people, Donald Trump, I'm not gonna take what these people say at face value automatically because TE critic is like, you know, at worst, it's like, Y'all are dumb or will automatically assume that research is wrong by default without actually spending time to think about it or research or verify, right? That's at worst, you know, assuming that people are stupid. That's at worst, right? Don't want to do that. And then at best, it's taking the time to actually rationally go through the data and look at the research. This is what I've had to do with learning type. I've had to use my TE critic and it was very easier for me to do it than other ENTPs because I've been stuck in my INTJ shadow for so long so I actually learned how to use it. Use my TE critic. So what I do is I read all of the research uh, regarding typology and then it's like, oh yeah, that's true with my TI parent. Nope, that's false. This crap, so I just pull out all the crap and take the gold, right? Take the good thing, take the, the true thing, and I stick it over here. And I take all the true things from all the reference points over here and all the true things over here. So then I create this like YouTube channel and this podcast and package up all the true and get it to you while leaving all the other crap over here and then lighting on fire. And then down into the dumpster fire, down the hill it goes. You see what I'm saying? That's what TE Critic does, right? Then we have FE Critic, I love FE Critic. It is so interesting to watch. It is so interesting to watch. It even has a little built-in hypocrisy and it's similar to, uh, to FI Critic. And don't get me wrong, TE Critic has its own hypocrisy in it because, um, <laughs> because TE Critic walks around believing everyone else is stupid, right? And then because it, it kind of is stupid for us to write off research and write off statistics as dumb and not real and not valid, right? Even though we haven't even spent time looking into it ourselves, right? So we're kind of hypocritical from that standpoint. So with a developed TE and you, you apply wisdom, you don't, do, you don't fall into that hypocrisy. Well, FE critic has similar hypocrisy because ESFPs and ENFPs have FI parent, right? And the FI parent, I'm sorry, it sometimes it just comes off as really selfish. If I parent can be super selfish, right? To the point where they're like, oh, I'm such a good person and I feel really good about myself. And you know, uh, I just have a really good personality and because of that you guys should just reward me because I have a good personality, right? You know, that's the more depraved approach of if I parent, but then the more charitable approach of if I parent is like, I'm a really good person, I'm going to prove it to you. I'm gonna prove it by living it, by walking it out, by showing it, right? A little different. The problem is when it comes to FE critic, in the same way that ESTPs and ENTPs walk around by default believing that people around them and statistics and data around them is just stupid, right? It's like, it's like TE critics like looking at all these graphs and it's like, well, we're just going to automatically assume that this is misleading data by default until we've had a chance to think about it, but then we're not even going to bother to think about it at the same time. So then based on that, we're just going to like continue to be ignorant because TE critic, hypocrisy, her, <laughs> yeah. So like, do you guys understand the theme here? Like it really is, you know, uh, you have the critic function and on a good, on a bad day, it's a hypocrite. You know, critic, hypocrite, interesting, like root word stuff. And then on a good day, it's wise, okay? So that's literally the difference between the two. It's like the two poles that it goes for. You know, whereas you have the uh, the nemesis and you have like the villain versus the ally, right? Well, this is how it is for the critic. 
hypocrisy versus, you know, wisdom. So there's a difference here. FE critic is very similar. E SFPs and ENFPs, they have their moral, their moral principles. They have FI parent. FI parent is very responsible with how it feels. And that's how it's easy to snap out the, the, the ESFPs and the ENFPs out of selfishness. It's actually very easy to snap them out of selfishness. All you have to do is criticize them. If you have the guts to criticize an ESFP and an ENFP and call them out on their selfishness, guess what? Out of all the FI types, they're going to stop being selfish. They're going to realize what they did wrong and then they're going to feel ashamed and then they're going to act out, act out on it because these people are responsible with how they feel about themselves and they understand selfishness. They understand, oh yeah, you're right, I am being selfish. I'm sorry. See, when you come across a depraved FI parent where they really make a selfish, it's either because they're not willing to listen to criticism or the people around them don't have the guts to criticize them, okay? So it's not necessarily always the ESFP or the ENFP's fault, just so you know. I know this audience is like, ah, oh, your man, you're, you're really bagging on them ENFPs, you're really bagging on them ESFPs, it's like because I'm tired of FI parent selfishness. And it's either because they're not listening to what other people are telling them criticizing-wise, or no one's got the guts to criticize them. Thank God for TI Child and TI Inferior because they always have the guts to criticize. Ugh, love those. Love those. I mean, so also does TI Hero, except at that point in time, it's like, oh, it's a little bug. Hammer. Yeah, not, not exactly the, the most efficient way uh, to uh, get to criticize them. But Effie Critic, because they're so responsible with how they feel, when someone's trying to get them to feel something, when someone's trying to, uh, you know, go to their heart, wow, my allergies are crazy right now. When someone's trying to uh, sell them on something or engage their feelings or pull their heartstrings, Effie Critic activates and it's like, are you kidding me? You're trying to manipulate me. Good luck trying to pull the heartstrings of an ESFP or an ENFP. But you know why? Because they do it to everybody else. And that's how they work. It's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's social engineering. It's manipulation. And manipulation itself is a neutral thing. It's not necessarily a good thing or a bad thing. Sometimes if you are being manipulated in e by an ENFP, it actually could be a good thing because they're, they're doing it with you in mind. Think about that for a second. Like it, it, it actually could be, you know. But... You know, some, but if they're being selfish, probably not. So you have to like understand, you have to know your ENFP, you have to know your ESFP. Are they being selfish or are they being selfless? You have to like verify. And worst case, criticize them to make sure. And if you're not sure, criticize them some more and then they'll definitely not be selfish at that point. But FE critic is very critical towards other people. I'm responsible with how I feel and how I handle my moral principles. Everyone else out there is irresponsible. Hypocritically speaking, these types automatically assume that everyone around them are bad people until proven otherwise. Just like ETPs assume that everyone around them are stupid. But the EFPs just assume everyone is bad. Because they're like, I'm a good person, but I don't know if you're a good person. That's literally what it is. That's, that's, how, that's how they work. That's how they operate, right? So... So they need to like be wise and realize that there actually are some good people out there instead of like themselves, right? And they need to not assume that people around them are bad people. It's kind of interesting how the critic, when it's going in that witch mode and making that evil spell to take over the world, you know, gets out of witch mode and realizes that there's people like them, right? And realizes that huh, they need to stop being hypocrites and give other people a chance and not to jump to conclusions, right? So that's the problem, people are jumping to conclusions. ISTJs and INTJs, ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, I love this one. TI critic, hypocritically speaking, hypocritically speaking, TI critic automatically assumes it's correct about things, even though it's not. It automatically assumes 
It's the smartest person in the room, even though it's not. Hypocrites. Wise, the uh, wise uh, component of the critic, for TI critic, it's when they always verify everything. They are responsible with their own belief system through their TE parent and what they believe, what they rationalize. But the TI critic exists to verify their beliefs and verify everything and verify everyone else's beliefs. But these two types, you know, the ICJ is, well, it's possible that you did that. So it's likely that you did it because it's possible. Because if I perceived it, it's likely you did it because I perceived that it was possible. And I'm the smartest person in the room. So I'm automatically right, which means you're automatically wrong. Just because it's possible. Even though it's not even based on reality. And they have no actual facts. And they weren't there themselves. And they had no experience, right? But they still assume that they're correct. INTJs, same thing. I'm going to assume that, you know, you're doing this right now. Because, you know, you wouldn't have said this. You wouldn't have said that. You wouldn't have done this. And, and I'm seeing a pattern here and I'm automatically right about this, right? Because you wouldn't have done all these things already. So they're analyzing a pattern of things that have happened, whereas the ICJ is analyzing a pattern of things that may happen. And then it's the opposite. It's like the opposite coin, right? The opposite side of the coin with both of them. But they still hypocritically assume that they are correct, even though they're not. The wise TI critic actually verifies everything ahead of time and gives people the benefit of the doubt. Oh, no wonder ETPs should be with ITJs because I, ETPs, more than any of the types, need the benefit of the doubt. And that's why the ITJs, their TI critic, can provide the benefit of the doubt, right? because they know that they actually don't know anything until they verify. That's the difference between the hypocrisy and the wisdom, okay? Careful, careful with the hypocrisy. It'll bite you in the butt. ESTJs, ESFJs. Oh, I love this one. I love this one. SE critic, right? SC critic. I actually one time watched uh, my ESTJ coworker who he showed up to work and he was wearing this uh, purple drab uh, shirt with like this weird pattern. And it was really uncomfortable to be around him when he was wearing this weird looking dark purple shirt with this weird pattern. It almost made him like, I don't know, he just you get weirded out watching him walk. And then at the same time, he criticizes my INF or my INTJ uh, coworker uh, at this hospital I work at. He criticizes him for what he's wearing and tell him that he has no sense of fashion. And we're all, and my coworkers and I are just all looking at each other like, does he even know? Does he even know that he's like literally doing a fashion faux pas right now by wearing that purple shirt while simultaneously he's criticizing somebody else for it? See, that's what the critic function does. The critic function criticizes people. That's what it does. It criticizes themselves or it criticizes others, but it's very critical. But if it's criticizing in the wrong way, it's a hypocrite and not being wise with its criticism. Well, that's what's happened with SE critic here because SE critic specifically has to, has to look good, has to be super presentable. It expects everyone else to be presentable. And if you're not presentable, that means if your shoe is not tied, if you have schmutz or dog hair or, or shavings from uh, shaving, or if you missed a spot when you're shaving or something, you are automatically an idiot. You are automatically someone I don't trust. You are unkept. As a result, you are much lower on the food chain than I am. I am a better person than you are. A much more elitist person than you are. Uh, and you are beneath me because you obviously can't even have the decency to dress yourself on a daily basis. Wow. ESJs do this. They literally do this with their SE critic. It is the most annoying thing in the world, especially when they themselves struggle with dressing up and actually presenting themselves, you know, at the same time. It's funny also, 
watch another way another way it comes out it's not just with fashion but with like using tools that same ESTJ coworker who's criticizing somebody else on how they're working on like they, we're working on some some hardware in the back uh, and he's criticizing that same INTJ about how he's using the tools and, and uh, handling uh, the tapes and then handling uh, the hardware uh, that we're working with. The ESTJ himself couldn't do it right when he took over and was trying to do the task himself. And then he realized, oh crap, I don't actually know what I'm doing. I thought I did. And then the INTJ came back and then finished it and then it worked, right? So, so they, they, they jumped to the conclusion, right? They assume that they have mastery over the physics, right? Over the hardware, over the tools, over the fashion, et cetera, over how they present themselves. And then all of a sudden, they actually don't. They actually don't because hypocrites, hypocrites, elitist hypocrites. Wow. I uh, happened to meet a bar one time. This ESTJ named Gia and she was beautiful, by the way, and dating my former coworker, which was not really necessarily my coworker because I was a contractor there and then he left the company at the hospital. Then I actually took over his job at like a different higher level than he did. So it was actually kind of cool, but she was heartbroken that she let, that he left her, but then they got back together and then she was happy again. And she was a brilliant ESTJ woman, but she liked to criticize me all the time about how I would dress. And to be honest, some a lot of my fashion tips that I picked up in my life actually did come from Gia. So Gia, if you're watching, thank you very much. But at the same time, sometimes, you just did not know how to dress yourself sometimes. So like, just recognize, you know, be careful where you're pointing your finger, like seriously. Um, but SE Critic, when it is helping other people, it literally can be like, hey, your shoe is untied. Hey, you might want to fix that. Hey, you're going into an interview. You might want to dress differently. Or hey, you know, uh, please use that tool correctly. Sometimes they're actually right. And the more life experience that they have with their SI parent, the more developed their parent is, the more their grandparent function, aka the critic, can actually criticize and offer advice and offer wisdom to other people so that other, those other people can make better decisions. Same thing, that ESTJ coworker again was doing this for an ESFP coworker and he was giving that ESFP coworker some life advice and sharing his experience. And then he was able to use his INFP subconscious, this ESTJ coworker of mine, to give life advice to this ESFP who was really struggling. And that ESFP took the advice and ended up having some successes in his life and also dodged a bullet, you know, the bullet where he almost got scammed by someone who claimed that they were like the IRS and the ESFP was about to pull out money and pay the scammer over the phone. And we're like, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. And the ESTJ was there to like hang up that phone and be like, no, let me tell you, bro, you're actually about to get scammed. Walk me through it. And the ESFP is like, thank God. All because of SE Critic. So there's benefits too, right? That's when they're being like properly critical when they're being wise instead of being hypocrites. See what I'm saying? Introverted intuition. Critic. I'm, I see everyone in the whole world is so irresponsible with what they want. So I'm not going to allow myself to want anything. And then I'm gonna get stuck in my comfort zone and not actually get anything done and risk failure to launch syndrome. Yeah, that sucks. So, hypocrites. INPs are hypocrites in this way because they look at everyone else and how everyone else is irresponsible with what they want. But they themselves, instead of actually taking a risk and risking irresponsibility with wanting something, they choose not to want anything. They choose inaction. Let me give you an example. So I met this INFJ girl one time and uh, she was, she was fantastic. Uh, it was uh, one of, uh, you know, one of my really good relationships, one of my uh, best intimate relationships that I've had. And um, she actually was seeing an INFP gentleman, uh, you know, around the same time. And then I came into the picture and then she's like, well, I can't be in a relationship with that guy anymore. And I'm like, well, what happened? Well, he just wouldn't commit. And I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, that's anti-critic. He's not allowing himself to want things because he's afraid of wanting the wrong thing. Okay, so let's explore that though. I'm not gonna like throw this INFP completely in the dumpster here on this podcast or on YouTube. So let's actually explore why that was. So 
This particular INFP is actually a really cool guy. Uh, I have a lot of respect for him. He's, he's very amazing at pool, by the way. Yes, because he has mastery over his SHL and for like self-discipline. And INFPs, if you're watching this, seriously learn pool. It, it'll definitely go over well for you. And the women will come up to you in the bar all the time. Seriously, learn pool uh, if you're an INFP. I recommend it big time. Uh, same thing with INTPs, uh, although INTPs kind of end up having they're kind of a little bit better at having that intellectual discussion, you know, whereas, you know, the INFP is like, you know, hey, I, I play pool, but I'm also the philosopher that plays pool at the same time. You know what I'm saying? You know, like it, it somehow works. So INFPs, this INFP, he ended up getting into a relationship with a woman. He got her pregnant. Everything was going fine. Everything was working out just fine. She had the baby and then the baby was healthy, it was great, he was very happy, and then out of nowhere, she left. Completely abandoned him, gone. And he ended up having custody of the child and, and had custody of his son. His son was in high school at this time when I, when I knew him. And his son is not in high school anymore, but, but still. And uh, he, he had that really bad experience. And he's like, wow, how could somebody want that? How could somebody want to abandon their son. How could someone really want to abandon me? Well, I don't know if I want to get in relationships then because you see what I'm saying? Like he had a really bad experience. So he's not allowing himself to want to be in a relationship because he's afraid of having another bad experience. When in reality, this INFJ woman was really good for him. They had super high mega compatibility, right? And they were actually working out. Their relationship was working. But because of his inability to commit, because of NI critic, because he was so critical over wanting things that he wouldn't even allow himself to want things, even though he criticizes everybody else for wanting the wrong thing with his any parent, y'all are irresponsible with your any parent. Okay, fine. If you're telling everyone INFPs, if you're telling everyone INTPs, INPs, if you guys are telling everyone that everyone else is irresponsible with what they want, you have no right to do that when you yourself won't allow yourself to want anything. Do you understand? If you do not allow yourself to want anything, if you're stuck in inaction, you have no right to tell or criticize anyone else that they want the wrong thing because you won't even take action yourself. So if you're not going to take action for yourself, then let people take action then. Otherwise, you need to prove it. Prove that you actually know what you're talking about and actually take action and risk failure for once. Oh, so that maybe you fail is maybe you won't like, oh, maybe that person really isn't irresponsible with what they want, with their intentions, with what they're about to do. Oh, yeah, INPs, wake up. I'm tired of this. It's because of this that you end up staying in abusive relationships for years and years and years, or you end up having failure to launch syndrome until you're 45, 50 years old, and then all of a sudden you wake up in midlife and you're like, what the hell, what am I gonna do, right? Stop criticizing everybody else for their bad actions when you won't even take an action. You can criticize other people for having bad actions or about to have bad intentions or have, you know, when you yourself are taking action hypocrites. So instead, be wise. And you can be wise by allowing yourself to want things, right? And slowly expand your horizons with your SI child carefully. You could do this with an SE child friend or an SE even inferior friend, because they won't let you down. And they'll be focused on giving you a good experience and slowly expanding your horizons so you can continue to take action. Otherwise, you're going to stagnate. And then you're literally on the path to death. Don't do it, INPs. You need to wake up. Stop being hypocrites. And then we have, oh, I love this one too. I love this one. It's so good. SI critic. Oh, the ISTPs and the ISFPs, when they like start saying how they have the memory of an elephant and they remember everything and they actually are insanely forgetful. It's so embarrassing. My ISTP pause. My ISTP boss, good guy um, at uh, at my uh, um, at my hospital, uh, my ISTP cousin, even like 
all of my ISTPs in my life, they do this. They think they can remember everything, but they don't because SI Critic, what it does, it only remembers the important stuff. And then they have the point of view, well, if it wasn't important, then why do I have to bother remembering it? But I remember everything anyway. Hypocrites, hypocrites. Like seriously, the hypocrisy, not good, right? Hypocrites. They claim that they remember everything, but they're insanely forgetful at the same time. So what you end up doing, if you're in a relationship with an ISP, what I always recommend people do is actually write down everything that they forget and date it and timestamp it so that when they go off talking about how amazing their memory is, you give them this huge list, which will piss them off and make them rage. And it's very fun to watch. Please record it and post it on YouTube so I can watch it, please. That would be awesome. <laughs> so like seriously, the SI critic. So instead, maybe they should just admit to themselves that they are actually kind of forgetful. And instead of getting really mad, because these people, they get mad with their SE parent and look at other people, because you know, the parent, the critic function is linked, you know, in that way, right? Because they're in orbit of each other. Not on axis, but they're in orbit of each other, right? And because of that orbit, they get so mad when other people forget things. SE parents, these two types, they get so mad or upset or frustrated when other people forget things, yet they themselves are really forgetful. It is annoying. Stop it, ISPs. Like seriously, stop it. And guess what? I'm gonna call you out. I'm gonna call you out every time you do this. Stop it. It's really annoying. Uh, but instead, the wise way about it is realizing, well, okay, yeah, I am forgetful sometimes, but I do know that I do remember the really, really, really important stuff, okay? And because it's important, that's what we need to be focusing on. That's what we need to be doing. That's how we are going to guide you in a certain way with their SE parent guiding this other person because the SI parent remembers what's most important. Also, the SI parent also causes them to be really loyal people. They can be loyal people. If they're not hypocrites, they can be loyal people. Course. instead of being that constant se parent i'm going to search for new experiences and never commit to a woman and just constantly go after woman to 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 woman because i'm a very sensual person and i'm not sure what i want and i'm just going to go for it over and over and over again when in reality is you actually do remember the kind of woman that you like that is that is loyal to you that gave that that gave you a good experience or you were able to give her a good experience you actually remember her but you feel guilty or you feel shame because you abandoned her because you're constantly trying to seek out these new experiences to share with other women at the same time or other men, ISP women, like seriously. Oh, you expect other people to be committed to you and yet you yourselves will not allow yourself to commit to others. Maybe you should be wise and then be willing to commit. That would be nice, ISPs. Maybe we could actually like, you know, trust you after that. Instead of potentially, I mean, ISPs often get labeled psychopaths. It's because of this commitment problem that they have, right? Or they get labeled narcissists. You're selfish because you keep going after all these relationships over and over because you're so sensual. You see what I'm saying? It's not to say that ESTPs or ESFPs aren't sensual because they're definitely sensual as well. ESTPs probably more so, but... With these ISP specifically, they have SE parent. They're supposed to be responsible with their sharing of experiences instead of just allowing their NI child to run amok, right? You gotta have that SE parent to like rein in that child, right? They need to have self-discipline. They expect everyone else around them to be self-disciplined, but they themselves are not self-disciplined. It's really annoying. Stop being hypocrites. Be wise. Allow yourself to remember the more important things. Think back in your relationships. Which ones were important? Go after those kinds of relationships or maybe return to those relationships. Yeah, I screwed up. And guess what? You find out she was waiting for you. Or guess what? You find out he was waiting for you. But he's still loyal to you even after all this time. And you gotta have the guts to ask forgiveness and actually humble yourself before this person. Yeah. That's like critic. Maybe you need to be loyal sometime. You expect everyone else to be loyal to. Maybe you need to be loyal yourself and actually have some honor for once. That'd be nice. 
Gosh, I'm loving this lecture. I get to light everyone on fire. Yeah. All right, so ENTJs and ENFJs. So, and E critic. Oh, I love it. I love this one too. Oh, man. I've had intimate relationships with both these types. Um, I've had really good friendships with both these types. I really like these types. I think they're they're fantastic and they're super high compatibility with me. And I love ENJs, but ENJs consistently have this problem about jumping to conclusions about my intentions and everyone else's intentions. They are always, always one foot in, one foot out, always watching out for that time they're gonna get betrayed. They just assume you're going to betray them. They just automatically assume it. And it's like, and this causes them, for example, especially, you know, sexually, they're like, oh, we're just gonna keep having casual sex over and over and over again because I automatically just don't trust anyone because that person's definitely going to betray me and I'm just gonna keep going back and forth, back and forth on the casual sex train. It's like, wait a minute, you're actually on a rocking horse, a lot of movement, but not going anywhere. It's because hypocritically speaking, expert intuition critic criticizes the intentions of other people. And it's not that they themselves won't commit to anyone. It's that they won't allow anyone else to commit to them because they don't believe it's actually real. They believe they're just going to be abandoned again especially ENJs, ENJs feel that abandonment harder than anyone else because they have SE child and it impacts their divine child. Who would want to abandon that child? Many people do. And then because of this, they become jaded and they're critical towards the intentions of other people. And they never believe me when I say that I'm loyal to them or committed to them and it never happens. They end up criticizing my intent indefinitely and it's so annoying i want to slap them seriously stop doing it how about you be wise and recognize that not everybody does this not everybody is going to backstab you listen use your se child if there's an si user around you that's actually loyal to you to the point where you don't have to loyalty check them Sometimes loyalty checks are healthy. Sometimes they're unhealthy. Be aware of that. So loyalty checking, right? Don't, like, be really careful. Um, this is why ENJs loyalty check people because they're, they're, they assume that they're going to be betrayed. And if, they pa if the person passes the loyalty check, oh, that person's not going to be betray me. I think I will allow this person to commit to me. Wow. It's not that these types have a hard time committing. It's just that they don't allow other people to commit to them because they are afraid, way afraid of being betrayed. In fact, so much so that they assume that they are going to be betrayed. Hypocrites. Why? Because they're very responsible with what they want. They do not just allow themselves to want things on a whim, even though they look like on the surface as super mega impulsive. It's just that what they want is such a rare thing that when they finally find it, they have to have it and then they go after it. And it looks like on the surface really fast. I was actually talking about... Um, uh, an ENFP uh, who's uh, potentially getting in a relationship with the ENFJ and the ENFJ is like super bombastic after this ENFP pursuing this ENFP super, super hard. And the ENFP is like, I'm not sure I'm really comfortable with that. But I'm like, no, it's, it's their NI parent. They're being responsible if they want. If they tell you that, that, that they actually want you, you probably should listen to that any hero because they don't just allow themselves to want anything. Which is funny because hypocritically speaking with their grandfather function while their parent fun or their grandparent function with their, their parent function, their parent function is very responsible with what it wants. But then, you know, the grandparent function just automatically assumes people are going to betray them when they can't even imagine themselves betraying them when in reality, betraying their, 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 their partner or their friend, right? When they end up actually betraying their friend because they assume that their friend is going to betray them. So they do like a pre-betrayal. 
What? How could you people live with yourself? Stop doing that, please. Stop jumping to conclusions about other people's intentions. I can't stand it. It makes me want to like literally do the Homer Bart Simpson thing to you ENJs. I get really angry when you do this. It pisses me off. Okay? Especially me, as a loyal SI user, have a pattern of behavior where I am consistent in showing and demonstrating my loyalty to you. Because I actually give a damn about you. Right? You ENJs. To the point where I'm willing to follow you over a cliff. I am there for your SE child. I am not going to abandon you. Unless, of course, you decide that you don't want me anymore and then you abandon me. Which is what you do because you assume that I'm going to betray you. Stop. So be wise. Don't be hypocrites. Be wise. Recognize that because you're responsible with your own intentions, other people might be responsible with their intentions. Me, I worry about my intentions. I worry about what I want. I worry that I'm wanting the wrong thing at times. I'm worried about my own future and I'm already worried about intending the wrong thing, especially like in a relationship with an ENJ. I'm worried that something bad could happen. So I'm already using my self-discipline to create boundaries and walls to make sure that that doesn't happen ahead of time for the ENJ's benefit, especially relationship speaking. It's even the same way in business. I make sure that everything is out and uh, uh, talked about, there's no covert contracts, there's nothing covert, everything is out in the air, everything is discussed, everyone understands the standard, all the ENJs that I work with know what I want, they know what my intentions are, and they know what I'm going to do, and they know that I am consistent and reliable. That way, they don't have to criticize my intentions because they always look at, well, Jason's intentions are always positive for me in my direction. He's actually being responsible with his intentions because he's worried about screwing up with his intentions already. I mean, because he is, I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to criticize him on that. So then the ENJ is no longer jump to conclusions about my intentions. Yeah, that'd be nice. Super important. So those are the critic functions. Those are the hypocrisies and the wisdoms of the critic function. So let's talk about that wisdom. The meaning of life. The meaning of life is this. We are here on this earth to suffer. We are on this earth to feel pain because what that causes us to become valuable as human beings, we become diamonds. Diamonds are created, as I say a million times, by heat, pressure, pain, and suffering. And every diamond is uniquely flawed, kind of like the human being. The human being is uniquely flawed. We have sin nature according to religious circles. We have the human condition according to psychological circles. It's all that, right? All that and a bag of chips. Actually, maybe many bags of chips, likely potato chips. Maybe it's Doritos. I don't know. Anyway, you have to realize that this is a problem. So the flawed. A perfect diamond is worthless because it was grown in a lab. A flawed diamond is imperfect, but it's precious. It's the most valuable thing. Human beings are to become precious treasure, precious diamonds, flawed yet beautiful. Suffering is the only way to get to that. Why? Because of wisdom. That is the meaning of life. Human beings are here on this planet suffering for the sake of gaining wisdom. And that wisdom comes out in our critic functions. These eight critic functions is literally where a person's wisdom exists. Starts out as hypocrisy, but then as they get on in years, as they start to realize that they are hypocrites and they humble themselves, then all of a sudden they start developing wisdom. Wisdom is the key. Wisdom is the most important, the most important substance in the cosmos under love. But how can you love somebody if you don't, if you lack the wisdom to actually understand love first? Remember that old saying, love your neighbor as yourself, right? That means you need to be responsibly selfish because you have no business loving somebody else if you're not loving yourself first. But how do you even know how to love yourself first?
You kind of have to be wise and actually know how to love yourself properly so that you can be wise and love other people properly, right? Wisdom is the precursor to love. You cannot have love without wisdom, which means you cannot have love without developing your critic function. Interesting. And also, when you're criticizing someone, obviously if you go after their inferior function, it's going to cause them to potentially create bitterness and hatred for you. When you criticize somebody on their critic function and you focus your entire attack, your verbal attack, everything that you're doing to hit this person hard in their critic function, guess what? They're gonna listen to you. They're going to learn from you. This is how you teach a human being lessons. You do it through their critic function. You grab that critic function, you stab it so many times until it finally is listening to you. They may get upset at you and angry, but deep down they know you're right because you're pointing out their hypocrisy. That's the point. You wanna develop wisdom, you destroy the hypocrisy in yourself and others, and then the wisdom will come. Get rid of the hypocrisy, the wisdom will come. The meaning of life is for human beings to gain wisdom so that we can love so that we could forgive people. Why? Well, it's like that meme that I love. I know too much psychology, or you know you know too much psychology when you can never really get mad at anyone because you can literally explain every reason behind all of their behaviors, right? So if you have wisdom and you have that level of understanding with people, right? When you have that understanding and you actually understand people, guess what? You can love them. You can forgive them. Oh my gosh. That reminds me of my, one of my most top five, most favorite quotes of all time from Orson Scott Card in his book, Ender's Game. Ender Wigan says, you know, when I get to know my enemy, you know, I end up understanding them so much so, every facet of their being, every caveat, every nook and cranny of who my enemy is. And when I finally know them and understand them at that level, I love them. And when I love my enemy, I destroy them or I utterly destroy them. Yeah. See, that's the point, folks. You need to reach understanding. Hashtag wisdom, aka wisdom. You need to reach understanding so that you can love people, right? Because if you understand everyone's reason for doing anything, then you're not judging them. Then you're doing that whole thing. It's like, oh, treat others the way you want to be treated. Hey, I'm an ENTP, you know, the type that a lot of people don't like. 3% of the population kind of rare and kind of like abrasive and harsh. And people don't really like ENTPs because like, you know, they alienate people, right? And I see this ESTJ and I see, and I learn that he's an ESTJ and I understand the ESTJs and I treat him as an ESTJ in hopes that he would treat me and be okay with me being an ENTP. See what I'm saying, guys? Treat others the way you wanna be treated. Gain wisdom, destroy the hypocrisy in yourself first, then destroy it in others. Get them out of their hypocrisy, grow wisdom in yourself, grow wisdom in other people. You do this through developing your critic functions, learn yourself, realize that you are a hypocrite and stop being a hypocrite, develop your own personal wisdom and then help others develop their wisdom so that we can become treasure so that we can have collective understanding of our fellow human beings all around the globe. And then as a result of that collective understanding, we have collective love. That's the real lesson of the critic function. That's the real lesson of wisdom. That, my friends, is the meaning of life. And the number 42. So, how to develop wisdom, you have to love truly. Love, true love, and love for your fellow man, be it in an intimate relationship or otherwise, comes as a result of wisdom and understanding. You have to develop your critic function. And the absolute best example of this kind of love in recorded history is a quote from a man who is dying. And he said, and I quote, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If you found this lecture useful, helpful, educational, enlightening, 
Please subscribe to the channel here on YouTube and on the podcast. Leave a like while you're at it. And if you have any comments or questions about uh, the critic function, please leave it below. Um, if you would like to uh, support uh, the channel, we'll have our Patreon link up, but uh, the podcast has its support link in the description below. Uh, we really appreciate any of uh, your donations or any of your monetary support. It helps keep the channel going. Uh, we're going to be trying to get rid of the Echo soon and going to have better lighting, etc. And uh, actually build a real studio. Uh, also, uh, any additional financial help goes towards developing our mobile applications and getting additional uh, content infographics out. We're going to be releasing a glossary. There's going to be page three of our type grid to help give you additional assistance when typing people uh, from a cognitive function point of view. It's going to be awesome. And then... Uh, also, if you want to get in our Q&A live streams, join the Discord server. The link is in the description below. Get on the Discord server. Leave your questions. We'll get uh, Jab and I will get to them on our Q&A uh, live streams. Also, this Tuesday, Jab is doing a fictional Q&A type of or a fictional typing uh, thing. Uh, he's going to be hosting in the Discord server 9 p.m. Eastern time, I believe, or possibly a little bit earlier than that on the CSJ Discord. Make sure you're there for that. If you want to join our meetup group, the link is also in the description below. Remember, guys. It's important. We need wisdom. Life is not about what is good or bad, as the FI or FE users would see. Life is not about what is true and false, as the TI users and the TE users would see. Life is not about that. We have to use all of our cognitive functions together and have relationships with each other. And as a result of our suffering, develop wisdom so that it's not about true, it's not about good or bad or true false. It ends up becoming life is about what is wise and what is not. And if you end up making decisions based on what is a wise thing to do and what is a unwise thing to do, you're that much closer to, you know, like enlightenment, uh, becoming a better person, becoming integrated, right? And that's how it works. So anyway, happy Thanksgiving. Uh, and uh, have a good night. I'll see you next time.